Today on Muscle Car. All right, all right. We've seen your emails. We've talked to you at the car shows. You ask for them, it's Tech Tidbits by request. Car work, interior, suspension, and dent repair. We've got it all. Muscle Car starts right now. Hey, guys. Welcome to Muscle Car. Today, we're going to do a bit of hopping around and hit on some odd and in how to. We're going to take a look at doing some interior work hit on some suspension tips, and then top it all off with some dent repair. But first, here's an underhood tidbit that might interest some of you guys. A lot of people are scared of carburetors because of their many internal components and removable pieces. What we're gonna try and do is give you some basic carburetor breakdown tech, and today we're gonna start with this. A standard Holley vacuum secondary four barrel. Back in the day, this was pretty much a standard carburetor for many of the big threes muscle cars at the time. What we're gonna do today is rebuild the vacuum secondary diaphragm. What happens when a lot of people start to rebuild the carburetor, this diaphragm does not come with the standard kit. But over the years, underhood conditions such as operating temperatures and contaminants can take its toll on the diaphragm inside this unit, making it operate slowly and sometimes not even at all. The first thing we need to do is move the choke thermostat housing out of the way. It's a simple matter of pulling a few screws and then setting it aside. With that out of the way, we can unscrew the diaphragm housing and pull the E-clip out of the way that keeps the diaphragm rod in place. Now the diaphragm housing is free to be worked on. So as we mentioned earlier, you can see that the contamination has definitely gotten to the backside of this old diaphragm. So what we're going to go ahead and do is change it over with this new unit that we got from Holly, which is definitely going to make an improvement on this four barrel carburetor's performance without a doubt. Well, before we put the diaphragm back in the housing, what we're going to try and do is make sure there's absolutely nothing lodging the vacuum port on the back side, which goes into the main body of the carburetor. And all we're going to do is take some compressed air, make one little shot through the housing itself. And as you can see, there was something in there. So it's a good thing we actually did that. Then I'll take some cleaner just to wipe it off and get any of the contaminant that might get up against the new diaphragm and get it off of the housing so we have a clean mating surface. And then we should be good to go to put the new diaphragm in the housing and get it mounted back on the carburetor. I'll hit the cap with a quick cleaning too in preparation for the new diaphragm spring. The spring kit from Holly comes with a chart that lets you select a spring based on how quickly you want the secondaries to kick open in this carb. We're gonna opt for the purple spring because of its middle of the road performance. It's a simple matter of taking the spring and clicking it into place. Well, now it's time to put the diaphragm back into the housing. And what I like to try and do is just a little helpful hint, is I like to hold the housing in my hand instead of in a vise or instead of with another tool, place the diaphragm on the bottom of the housing and support the rod with my hand so that when you put the lid back on, the spring pressure will not collapse the rubber diaphragm, which does give it a chance of ripping. Then take the bolts and put them in by hand as far as you can gently to support the housing itself and then just snugging them up with the screwdriver when we're finished with the lid of the diaphragm already in place. There's a simple test we can do to make sure that it's gonna work properly before we put it back on the carburetor. All you need to do is compress the rod in the housing and put your finger over the vacuum port in the center of the diaphragm assembly, let go of the rod and see if it stays. If it stays, that means there is a vacuum and you have a good seal. And then you let it go and you see the rod operates as it should and it's ready to go back on the carburetor. Remember, like I said, most people would go through the trouble to rebuild this complete carburetor and neglect this one component. This one $10 piece, when changed, can make a huge difference in your carburetor's performance and is well worth the money. Got a worn out seat that you want to turn into a royal can catcher? Our by request builds continue with Tommy stuffing a Mopar seat full of new foam. Then we upgrade some control arms and Rick does some dent wizardry. We're gonna pick up with some interior work you guys asked for by stepping over to our Pro Street 74 Dodge Dart. So far, she's been gutted, got new suspension on the front, been back halved and tubbed, received a six point cage, we got new bumpers and seats, dropped in a late model blown Hemi, and worked on getting her ready for the road. And that includes making her nice and comfy. Luckily, Classic Industries has us covered, literally. 
These seat covers are designed to fit a set of buckets out of a 72 Duster Demon, and that's what we've got over here. Now, if you luck up and your seat foam is in good enough shape, all it is is slipping on a set of seat covers and you're ready to head down the road. But our driver's side has spent a lot more time shelving the old Christmas ham, if you know what I mean. So the seat foam is all worn out and squashed and needs to be replaced. It just takes a couple of screws and bolts to get your seat back and bottom separated. Just make sure you don't lose any hardware while you're at it. Now with our seat frame all stripped down, we're gonna knock off this old rusty scale and put on a coat of protectant. Reason being is that it'll stop any further corrosion and number two, it improve the looks of this old nasty thing. A simple way to do this at home is with a wire brush. Give the rough spots a good once over, making sure to knock off the scale that's developed on the surface of the metal. So we're gonna speed it all up by taking a trip over to the blasted all cabinet. Another advantage to bead blasting besides speed is so that you can really power through the gnarly stuff and get down to bare metal. With our piece all prepped, we're gonna hit it with a coat of Loctite Extend Rust Treatment. What this stuff does is destroy rust, then seals and protects the metal. Anywhere it reacts with rust, it will turn purple, and then once it dries, it forms a primer coating. And if you're working with body panels, it also jives with plastic filler and fiberglass. Once that's dry, we can gussy it up with a coat of Duplicolor enamel, and then she's ready for some foam. We ran down to the local upholstery shop and picked up the foam that we're gonna use. We went with the medium density stuff, but it comes in several different variations. Now, if you wanted, you could change this stuff up and give the seat a total different feel. We're gonna use an electric kitchen knife to rough in the foam. Now, this thing will work a lot better than using a utility knife. Now, we need to set that up there. I'll draw some lines that will tell me where the creases need to be on my new foam. Then start sculpting it with an air grinder. Michelangelo, step aside. You don't need a really aggressive disc to do this. Heck, it's foam after all. I'll grab my electric knife again and use it to fillet out the bottom of the piece where the foam sits onto the frame. Then I'll clip off the rings that hold the wires in the old foam and cut out the ones that are molded into it. The original seat had some webbing made into it, so since we're using something a little different, I'm gonna use some of this burlap to reinforce those rods. A little Loctite spray adhesive will hold the burlap in place, and I'll grab the new covers and poke the rods through the little channels where they hold the cover onto the foam. Now originally these rods were wrapped with an adhesive paper, so we went ahead and wrapped them with some masking tape. The reason they done that is that whenever you clamp a hog ring around it, it actually gives it something to bite to, other than just sliding around on the rod. Now we gotta hog ring these things together. You push the rod down onto the groove that we cut into the foam, then fold the edge up so that you can get that rod close to the one that you installed into the cover. A hog ring and a pair of hog ring pliers will make them best friends forever. Aww. <laughs> Recovering one of these things takes a whole bunch of pulling and tugging and grunting. So make sure when you run across one of these guys that do this every day, show them some respect, because it sure ain't easy. Whenever you pull in seat covers tight, you want to try to pull it as flat as possible, because some wrinkles that come out, you can massage out, but if they're lapped over, it's just going to have a wrinkle in it. Well, there you go. We repeated the process for the top piece. Now all we got to do is steam the vinyl to help relax it so the wrinkles will go away, and then we're good to go. Looking to beef up your arms? No, not those arms, your control arms. It's a low buck way to prep your suspension for battle. Then learn why a dent on a compound curve takes a special approach. Welcome back, folks. A lot of y'all out there are sending us emails and looking for ways to improve factory suspension components on the cheap. Unlike these high-end, purpose-built autocross machines, a big weak point of muscle air suspension systems was that they tended to flex where they weren't supposed to. A good way to add some toughness is to take your factory control arms and box them in. 
The rear arms on the stock frame of our Oldsmobile are a perfect example. They're made out of stamped steel and GM never felt the need to go in and add a fourth wall in the manufacturing process. Realistically, this design is fine and dandy for everyday use, but let's say you're going to do something a little more aggressive like drag racing or even autocross. There's a low buck way to keep them from flexing and reduce the risk of breaking something. Build on a budget. Muscle car projects that save you time and money. We've got to prep this thing to do some welding on it, so it's going to take a little trip into the sandblasting cabinet. But if you got a grinder, that would work too. With a nice clean slate, we can begin the process of boxing in the arm. I'm going to use a grease pencil to draw out an outline of the piece I'm boxing. You can do this with a marker too or anything else that'll stick to the metal. I'm using a piece of 8 inch steel. That's a little thicker than what the link is made out of, but there ain't no need of making this thing out of a big old piece of quarter inch because the part's only as strong as its weakest point. Now when welding in a piece like this, I like to start at one end and work to the other. This allows you to bend and shape in the boxing plate. Just tack, bend, tack until it's completely boxed. And a quick massage with a hammer takes care of the sharper bend. Another weak spot to these links is the mounting point. You can see that the bolt has actually elongated the hole. So what I'm going to do is make a plate, weld it on here, it'll repair it, plus make it stronger at the same time. Now with my plate built, I'll go ahead and melt it all together. And while I'm at it, I'm going to weld in the boxing plate too. Some quality time with a grinder, and she's like a new penny. We're ready to go ahead and install a new bushing into our control arm. And since we're going more for a performance-minded upgrade, we kept that in mind when we ordered this kit from Classic Industries. Urethane is more durable than stock-style rubber bushings and can stand up to the stress of high-performance driving quite a bit better. It's also a firmer compound than rubber, and when you throw a whole lot of stress on them, they don't compress as much, which keeps the components aligned better. With this thrust washer slid into place, we're pretty much done with this one and ready to move on to the other ones. Now you can get these bushings for individual sections of the car, or you can give Classic Industries a call and they can hook you up with this kit, and you can upgrade all your factory rubber. Coming up, we take a look at the ins and outs of making a complicated dent repair on a curved surface. You're watching Muscle Car. For a DVD copy of this episode, just go to PowerBlockTV.com and order your copy for just $5.95 plus shipping and handling. Start your own Muscle Car collection, delivered right to your door from the PowerBlock. Hey guys, welcome back. You've seen us fix a lot of dents, scrapes, gouges, holes, whatever, in a bunch of cars over a bunch of years. And usually, we just jump straight ahead and get right into the real technical stuff. But today, we're gonna slow down, take a breath. We're gonna call this Bodywork 101. Now Keystone Automotive sent me this hood here that I can use for demonstration purposes. Now I'm going to show you how to fix a dent in a flat surface and in a curved surface. Now we're going to hit the flat ones first because they're pretty simple to do. Get your dolly. I'm going to use a dolly that has kind of a rounded face on it just because it's a lot easier to use. Now on the back side of the panel, hopefully you can reach them. Now find where the tip of the dent is right there and put your dolly in there until you can just feel it rocking on there. And with a little bit of pressure on the back side of the hood, real easy, start working that up. And just go real easy, real easy. Don't start smacking it because you stretch it out and make a bigger mess out of it. But that's it. And you don't want to hit the center of it. You want to hit from the outside on the high spot. The main mistake I see guys do is they just go in there and they start hitting it too hard. Now little dings like that are about as simple as they get. You can sand that out, put a little bit of primer on it, block it, and you're good to go. Now a little bit more complicated dent is something like that on a curved surface. Let me show you why. I welded this together real quick just to kind of give me an idea of how metal reacts when it's hit on a compound curve like this. Check it out. You may end up with a dent in the top, but it pushes these edges out. So now you have 
high spots on either side of your dent. Now a lot of guys will see that and try to fill the dent. Well, what they don't realize is that you've got a high spot around it. So you fill the dent and now you've got a dent over here or what looks like a dent. So you come over here and you start smacking it trying to fill it and you end up chasing that thing all the way around that shape. You've got to slow down and you've got to get that metal back in shape before you do any kind of filler work. Just like if this was on the leading edge of the hood, you need to get this worked up and get those high areas down before you do any filler work. So let's hit a couple times. Put a little bit of pressure on it. And see how that works it in? Get it right back into shape. Now let's do the hood. Guys, that's about it. Prime it, paint it, and you're down the road. Now, hopefully I've been able to show you some of the basic steps in dent repair and show you that you need to adjust your technique depending on if it's a flat area like this, which is relatively simple, or a curved area like this that can get a little more complicated. If you guys have any questions about anything on the show today, you can check it all out at PowerBlockTV.com. But for this week, we're out of time. So until next time, we're out of here.